Good morning, everybody. It uh, seems to be a bit more difficult uh, compared to yesterday to start uh, the IPPC today. Uh, I hope everybody had a great time yesterday at, uh, at the dinner and at I IPPC as well. Um, I hope you had the chance to do a lot of uh, networking and gather a lot of information yesterday during the, the session and in between the sessions. Um, just like to do a couple of formalities, remind you that uh, we are engaging on social media. So if you do so as well, please use the hashtag uh, IPPC2023. We also have, uh, during the breaks, we have our networking area. So uh, please participate into our passport program. Uh, so uh, for us, told you are able to win a magnificent prize. I think it's uh, an Apple Watch you can, uh, you can win. So please participate into that, uh, into that program. Um, also, we uh, thank our sponsors to make sure that we're able to make everything possible here today. For example, Asahi Kase, Fresinus Kabi, Hemonetics, Max Systems, Space Science, Cinemat, Stradismat, Abbott, Immunotech Biocenters, and not to forget Kidron, who organized yesterday the uh, first uh, IPPC dinner. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the dinner yesterday. Thank you, thank you for that. So, having said that, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, our uh, global board chair, uh, Charles Platford, who is also president of the Plasma Derived Therapies Unit at, uh, at uh, Takeda, to do the opening address of today. Charles. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you all enjoyed the first day of the conference and also the dinner last night. Um, I got in pr pretty late, and I was reminded that uh, that the UK is no longer part of the European Union, and that I was supposed to queue like everybody else uh, to come into Portugal. So I spent an hour coming through customs last night. I just thought I'd share that little anecdote with you. Um, but good morning, everybody. Very happy to be here. It's always a privilege to be surrounded by so many uh, like-minded professionals who have a passion and purpose for ensuring sustainable supply of plasma to translate into plasma-derived therapies that can really benefit patients around the world. And particularly, obviously, we're talking about the role that Europe can play in fulfilling that goal. It's now just over 16 months, actually, since I became president of the Plasma Derived Therapies Business Unit uh, at Takeda, and just over one year since I became the chair of the PPTA Global Executive uh, Board, and what a privilege it has been. In that time, uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting with many donors and uh, patients. So I understand clearly why it's so important um, that we work towards creating a safe and more resilient global plasma ecosystem. Uh, I've also developed a much deeper appreciation of the challenges and complexities of sourcing plasma and manufacturing uh, plasma-derived medicinal products, or PDMPs as we call them, across the world. Yet even among well-informed uh, stakeholders, I often observe a fundamental disconnect between the expectation of the continual availability of essential PDMPs, like immunoglobulins, and the collection of plasma. This typically reflects a significant underestimation of what is required to strengthen our healthcare systems and to enable sustainable of supply of plasma and PDMPs. It's why gatherings like this are so essential and why I am delighted uh, to be here today with you all. As Martin indicated, the first session this morning is on the draft EU SOHO regulation, something I think we're all uh, very familiar with, and a critical piece of legislation that presents a once-in-a-generation opportunity uh, to increase plasma donation in Europe, to support patient access to PDMPs, and to reduce Europe's 40% reliance on the US for plasma to make these medicines. In the public debate on SOHO, the disconnect I referenced is especially visible. I'd like to say a few words about this 
and in particular about ethics, donor health, and the importance of partnership. Uh, there have been strong views expressed throughout the debate these past few months about how ethics must be at the heart of this regulation. And I could not agree more. The biggest ethical question we must solve is meeting the growing needs for safe, efficacious uh, treatments derived from plasma with ever increasing number of people in Europe whose lives depend on these treatments. We cannot do this without improving the availability of plasma needed to achieve that. However, if we make the ethical focus about whether to allow a small fixed rate compensation or allowance as part of a range of compensation options, we risk losing sight of the bigger picture. Today, the data shows countries in Europe that offer compensation um, and allow private plasma donation centers to operate alongside the public and third sectors collect by far more plasma in Europe. So why would EU policymakers on ethical grounds not take steps to ensure that all countries in the EU have the choice to introduce a range of proven compensation options for substance of human origin donors, including plasma donors. After all, access to medicines and patient lives are at stake. This brings me to donor health, because that is the concern of those who advocate against some form of compensation. The public, private and third sector organizations who collect plasma in Europe, including in the four EU countries that contribute half of Europe's current supply, all abide by the same stringent safety and quality regulations imposed in their respective jurisdictions. These regulations govern donor eligibility, maximum donor frequency, and maximum compensation levels, to name but a few. Plasma donation is a safe, irrespective of whether it is compensated or not. And that is supported by a wealth of studies on donor health. So let's leverage the SOHO regulation to maintain a framework for safe plasma donations in Europe. Protecting donor health is in the best interest of donors, patients, and industry, because without healthy plasma donors, there would be no life-saving and life-transforming medicines for these patients. It's why donor health is an important uh, aspect for all stakeholders, and particularly uh, for industry, as is patient health. Finally, I'd like to make a call for partnership to all stakeholders engaged in the public debate on the availability of PDMPs and plasma collection. Working with the rare disease community for many years, I've seen the power of partnership advance and accelerate progress in complex areas like diagnosis, access, and research and development. To ensure patients have reliable access to life-saving, life-transforming plasma medicines, we must collect more plasma, all of us. Let's work together to move Europe towards greater open strategic autonomy. Our sector works alongside public and third sector organizations to collect plasma in Austria, Czechia, Germany, and Hungary. And together, we contribute almost half of Europe's current plasma supply. We stand ready to do more alongside others in terms of investment, innovation, and helping to raise standards to strengthen the region's resilience. We are ready to support policymakers in creating a legislative framework uh, that is grounded in reality, future fit, and that enables everyone who collects plasma in Europe to play their part. Together, we can protect donor and patient health and change and save more lives. This is an important time for plasma in Europe with SOHO and the general pharma legislation offering opportunities to bring positive change. We will be watched closely beyond Europe in terms of the outcomes we deliver. Ultimately, it's a test for addressing outdated policy and regulatory barriers. And so let's show the world we know how to lead the way and to set the best example. Uh, I wish you all an excellent meeting and look forward to robust dialogue and discussions during the course of the day. 
and I hope we'll have the opportunity to discuss this topic and others as we meet in and outside of this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giles. And indeed, we will be discussing the SOHO regulation and uh, other topics with several stakeholders that we will have uh, present today. But first, we start with an interview uh, with the European Commission, interview uh, of uh, Stefan van der Spiegel, who is Head of Sector uh, for the Substance of Human Origin. So allow me to welcome uh, on stage our leading ladies of the European office, uh, Dominica Mistella, who is the Senior Director, Head of uh, Global Regulatory Affairs and Marilena Vrana, who is Director Lead of Public Affairs, who will be grilling Stefan for the morning. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Stefan. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, everybody. So we can hear you great, thank you. So, <clears throat> Stefan Giles mentioned just now <clears throat> that um, there is a fundamental disconnect between the expectation of continual availability of essential plasma therapies and the availability of plasma to manufacture them. Mm -hmm. Over the past 20 years, the private sector has contributed significantly in growing plasma collection in the EU out of the 8.4 uh, million liters of plasma to, collected today, the private sector collects 46% of it, mainly through plasmapheresis, and in only four EU member states. The remaining 54% uh, comes from uh, the public and third sectors, recovered uh, mainly from whole blood donations. But 8.4 million liters of plasma is not enough to meet the EU patient needs. We also need to import 40% from the US. How does the European Commission foresee the SOHO regulation to contribute in lowering the EU's high dependency to US plasma and strengthen the European Union's open strategic autonomy? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction and, and good morning, everybody. I very regret, much regret that I'm not with you um, in person. I'm going to set up my headset if not I hear myself speak again. So, um, and thanks for the introduction. I think, uh, first of all, um, we, we really do fully recognize and, and thank the, for the important role that the private sector is playing in, in uh, contributing to the plasma collection as well as uh, in, in the eventual manufacturing of the plasma derived medicinal products. Um, first of all though, um, when we look at, at the, the actual work and the subject of discussion today, the, the SOHO regulation, I, I, it is important to manage our expectations uh, a little bit. I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the role of this uh, SOHO framework is uh, um, only a supportive role. It is about ensuring safety and quality of um, plasma and plasma derived medicinal products. Uh, it is not about how we organize the collection of plasma in the European Union. Of course, it has an impact on that, but I just I think it's important to keep in mind that the EU as such has no mandate in how plasma is collected in, uh, in the member state. As you uh, laid out before there, indeed, um, th those decisions are, are taken at member state level. And in all the member states, there's a role there for the public uh, blood services. And as you laid out before, there's four countries in particular that also have given a role there to the, to the private sector. As European Commission and as EU legal framework, we um, stay very neutral uh, towards that. Uh, we, we, um, our rules are on safety and quality and whoever is organizing the collection of plasma, we are expecting them to comply with those uh, rules. Now, that being said, I think uh, those safety quality rules can contribute to some um, uh, facilitating or making it a bit easier to collect or import uh, plasma. Um, in the first uh, place, I what um, I think there's a lot of room and potential for harmonization. Uh, first of all, 
across um, the European Union between countries, how, how the, the safety and quality is assured and therefore that facilitates the exchange of plasma and other so across borders. And secondly, also harmonization with other legal frameworks, in particular the pharma framework. Um, where um, as the particularity of, of this sector, there is a really need to make sure that the, the flow of regulation is well and, and of requirements so that the flow of the plasma into the plasma derived medicine products can also go, go smoothly. And the last element I wanted to underline from, from the legal framework is the, um, the importing provisions, which um, we actually um, have or are already quite well set up in a good coordination between the SOHO and the pharma frameworks and that relates to the whole work of the colleagues on the, on the plasma master file. That part will, uh, will not be touched and is now fully recognized also in the SOHO framework. So I think that to start would be a couple of points that uh, I would like to put on the table. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you for reminding us that the SOHO is actually about safety and quality. And the SOHO regulation is actually an example in um, the shift of approach. In the past directives um, were more oriented towards safety of patients and SOHO now has donors in, uh, in the heart of the regulation. For the collectors of plasma and manufacturers of DMPs, donors health and safety is uh, of paramount importance. The SOHO, however, covers many different substances of human origin than only plasma. Plasma donation via plasmapheresis is a safe procedure with extremely rare occurrences of donor adverse events. But uh, different SOHOs imply different risks. And at the moment, the proposal classifies, if I may say, some donations as more risky than others, including plasma donation. Looking ahead and considering future-proofing the legislation, instead of making a prejudgment of which donations are risky, wouldn't it make more sense to evaluate the risk of SOHO donations based on donor adverse occurrence detected by the SOHO entities and part of their vigilance and reporting requirements, which is also foreseen into the proposal? Thanks a lot for that uh, question. Um, yeah, first of all, indeed, um, the donor protection has become much more indeed at the heart of, um, of the um, regulation. It has become much more important. It, it, donor protection was not at all foreseen in, in the current plot and, and tissue cells directives. But I think we all agree that it needs to be really central to ensure a sustainable supply. Um, I think we all agree that the donors need to be reassured that uh, we will in first place also take well care of their health. Um, that being said, um, so the, 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 the donor protection is introduced and with that a couple of specific measures in particular screening for the health of the donors, make sure that serious as well reactions are, are reported. Many things that are actually already see happening uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis today, um, even if it's not mandatory or required. Um, what uh, I think I, I want to slightly correct is that plasma collection would be considered as a, as a risky uh, donation. I don't think that's what the, the proposal said. The proposal said there are a couple of uh, risk factors that uh, need to be uh, taken in, into account um, for some donations. Um, um, those, uh, and, and one of them is, is frequent donations. And it, I think what the proposal refers to is not to plasma uh, collection as such, but to frequent plasma collections from the same donor, like it would also refer to some, some other SOHO, some risk factors are, for example, a surgery, or pickup of, of egg cells, or the need to give a donor uh, medical treatment before he can make um, a donation. And for those kind of, uh, risk factors, we are expecting an extra layer of protection of donors in form of, of monitoring the donors' health and some specific measures. But I think, uh, as far as I understand, that that is already also current practice in your sector. I think you do regularly extra monitoring sample the genes in, in the donors. So it's not necessarily something that, that would really have a strong impact 
And then, of course, as, as you say, the, the, the real technical details, um, they will have to be worked out later in, in technical plans. I think we, your uh, sound is also breaking a little bit. It's not just my voice. <laughs> um, yeah, indeed, monitoring is standard practice uh, in the sector because it's important for us to gather data on, on donor health and ensure that uh, donors uh, are safe. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it was more on the, uh, in, uh, the reference at the moment of frequent plasma donation implying significant risk, uh, contrary to the data already in place, showing that frequency, which is regulated, has no impact uh, in the donor's health in the end. But moving on, you mentioned before that collection systems is not within the mandate or the remit of uh, the EU to, um, to, to standardize collection systems. It's up for the member states to decide. But there are certain general rules that uh, will set those frameworks. And unfortunately, from the launch of the proposal, there have been strong views expressed throughout the public debate and in particular in the negotiations within the European Parliament about ethics, focusing only uh, on whether or not nationally regulated small fixed rate allowances uh, as part of a range of compensation options will be uh, are ethical or not. And as we are drawn into this debate, we are losing sight of the ultimate goal and the purpose of the regulation, which is about safety and quality. Data for, collected from the four EU member states where the private sector works alongside with public and third sectors show that um, more plasma is collected. And in those four countries, uh, fixed rate allowance is regulated and is allowed. Do you consider from the Commission's perspective that compensating donors from, uh, with a small fixed rate allowance is compatible with a voluntary unpaid donation or is it unethical? And do you consider that the European Commission's proposal regarding compensating donors was balanced on donor safety versus patient access? How do you see the debate as the debate evolves? Would you consider um, that patient access to PDMPs may be jeopardized if we are going into models of prohibiting uh, fixed rate allowance and um, compensation will completely be excluded. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, first of all, I, I don't think it's up to me to make uh, member state specific comments to say which country is doing uh, well, with what practice are not. But I think if you look at uh, our commission proposal, it does indeed um, propose to um, foresee um, some compensations that can be possible uh, with fixed rates. We expect those fixed rates then to be set and defined by them at member state level uh, for the different types of donations in a way that they are financially neutral. And financially neutral means in basic language that um, of course, they should take away the barriers for donation. They should um, finance or should not be a barrier to make um, donors to make a donation. But it should also not lead to a situation where this becomes an income or more than than just a compensation for for the the donors uh, that are that are deciding to make that uh, donation. Um, so I think our uh, that was uh, that's our commission proposal. Before we we made that commission proposal, we I think we really have reached out a lot to the to the field and both sides. I think in the private as well in the public sector, and we felt that for both sides there was. Um, uh, this was a kind of acceptable uh, solution that could move forward. Um, that being said, I think um, it's normal that also this debate needs to take place in, in the European Parliament. I, I think, uh, and, and to end, I will say something that I think I said already two years ago on, on, on this debate, that um, we are expecting and we are seeing a lot of debates in the European Parliament on this point, but in, in the end, um, because there's so much debate, it means again that the two 
views are on the table uh, discussing and um, because our, because we did that exercise before making our proposal we really expect that the, the final proposal will be quite close to to the commission proposal but okay that's me speaking at this point of course we need to do the trialogues and, and the whole discussion thank you very much Stefan for the clarification and now I will pass the floor to my colleague uh, Dominica Good morning, Stefan. So um, I'm going to um, switch gears a little again. Thank you uh, for being with us today. So I would like to touch upon the EU pharmaceutical legislation. So certainly um, another big, very, very important um, framework within the union that's being revised. Um, <clears throat> so the initiatives that are presented in the framework will, of course, affect the entire pharmaceutical industry in Europe. Um, specifically for us, um, it is going to be impactful because it's going to um, affect the range of, of provisions, as you mentioned, in the plasma master file and otherwise. But considering that this is um, not the only framework that is being revised, we saw in place since last year um, the, the new EMA mandate implemented. Now we are going through the motions of the SOHO regulation. Has actually the Commission evaluated the combined impact of actually three legislations that we are going to be governed um, under on the PDMP manufacturers on our on, on our sector? Certainly, I am aware impact assessments have been conducted. So, can you perhaps um, give us a little bit of feedback on that? Yeah, thank. Indeed, we, we do in our standard approach, uh, Dominica, we, we do assess the coherence with, between the different uh, legal frameworks. But of course, some things here had to be geared uh, quite quickly. I think the EMA mandate in particular was really a reaction also on the COVID crisis. Um, that being said, uh, I do feel that um, at least in the, between the services, uh, between uh, EMA and uh, the, the Commission between the pharma authorities and the SOHO authorities, there is really quite some dialogue and we would say even an increasing dialogue. I, I think somehow COVID was a good um, occasion for that. I think thanks to COVID, we really have been um, coming together much more and, and been thinking practically also how, how what we can do to to align the frameworks further to make it easier for you i think we have got those uh, discussions on the inspections inspections in third countries the remote inspections some donor criteria were reassessed i think that's the kind of um uh, interactions we we have uh, seen at that moment and what you will see in both the frameworks the soho proposal and the pharma proposal is that we are we are trying to really embed uh, that kind of collaboration in, in the two frameworks. Both of the frameworks are now having some provisions that really call for the respective authorities to reach out and coordinate their views uh, on specific regulatory uh, questions and to do that already at national level and, even, and also where possible or needed at, at a European uh, level. Um, so we, we have brought that approach into the two uh, proposals. Um, and of course, then we also, also want to build further on some good experience from the past. And I think one good experience is, is uh, the Annex 14 of the, of the G which really have laid down for the collectors what kind of expectations there are from the manufacturing side. Um, and uh, I think that, that is a really good approach that we also want to want to build further on. So I think, yes, we are trying to really keep everything harmonized, but I must also say it's not always easy with the, with the high pace of developments. Yes, I think that's that's. I, I think this is this is certainly what we are seeing, and we are very grateful that attempts are being made. Um, harmonization is the key word, since um, our sector is being governed by both SOHO legislation and the pharmaceutical legislation. So. Um, Going back to inspections, because obviously we are inspected by um, EU member states inspectors on under the SOHO provisions and also for, for the collection and the testing um, and under, under the pharmaceutical framework for the manufacturing of PDMPs. So my question to you in terms of harmonization, 
Are there concrete um, initiatives ongoing, for instance, to make sure that inspections are, are harmonized between the, the initiatives? Certainly, 2015, 2016 um, were some initiatives ongoing by the Commission with regard to the implementation of an EU-wide risk-based approach to inspections. We see um, the proposal for wording of a risk-based approach to inspections in both SOHO and the pharmaceutical legislation. Are there concrete initiatives? Because Again, once the once the framework is finalized, it, it, it's there. So obviously, is there any 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 back uh, any groundwork ongoing at the moment? Really concrete steps. I think it would be very helpful for our audience to hear that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think in first place, you're right. I think at this moment, we are really putting the conditions in place to make sure that kind of um, co coordination is better possible. So I referred already to this. Um, mechanisms of uh, of bringing the sector authorities together but you're right i think what is a big opportunity also is the fact that in the both frameworks now we are moving towards risk-based planning of uh, inspections now um at this moment uh it, it this um, too early we have not really defined really what are how the, the risk-based planning will be done but uh, we are certain factors will play a role like the history of a site, the, the volume of the site, and and and, and etc. That being said, we have within the framework today, we have already um, a dedicated group of experts that comes together from the different SOHO authorities in Europe. They're called the Inspection Experts Subgroup, and it's exactly their mandate to develop guidelines on different inspection elements like this one on, on risk-based inspection. We know that that group is also in close contact with uh, actors who do the same in the pharma sector, be it centrally in EMA, but also more decentrally like in, in the PICS uh, group. There, there is a, a subgroup under PICS that focuses on blood tissue cells, uh, ATMPs. So those links are being made. So I think um, everything is getting in place to make, to ensure that uh, coordination better, but um, the, the concrete guidelines yet, I don't think they have been uh, set yet on how, on how that should be done. Thank you. I think that's very helpful to know. Um, another point I would like to touch is certainly as you mentioned, COVID has been useful for a few things, um, and one of them is certainly to highlight uh, the need for, for uh, the European Union to ensure um, stable and, and, and safe supply of, of medicines um, to patients who rely on them. And again, this is across the three way frameworks, what we are seeing is, 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 is a high emphasis um, really on, on, on reporting, on monitoring, on um, provision of data um, by the industry to the Commission, to EMA. So um, again, this has to do with harmonization and the provision of, of data. Are there any initiatives ongoing to make sure that there is, um, that, the, that, the, that there is, that the burden of, of duplicative reporting is, is, is limited because, of course, until the frameworks are in place, until the frameworks, the provisions are set out, it is likely that, uh, that there will be some duplication. But I think over the course of the time, this is something that our industry is concerned about as we then report um, various data to, under the three legislations. So are there any concrete initiatives perhaps you can um, refer to that would coordinate a little bit in terms of what we report to whom we have um, significant reporting obligations, for instance, both starting material as well as finished product under the PMF. We then have to report additional data under the EMA mandate and additional reporting under pharmaceutical legislation. So could you perhaps um, expand on that a little to how, how to deal with the reporting burden? Are the initiatives ongoing? Thanks. I think it's a concern that we really do acknowledge and, and it's not a concern just coming from you. It's a concern that we see across uh, the sector, uh, the Soho sector, and I think also in the pharma sector, they, they see the same, that we, we really need to be efficient on how data are collected and then used. And, and there's always a, a mantra that comes back. It's, it's collecting at once and using it often. Uh, I think that's really what we have really in the back of our minds. And I think for the Soho sector, that's in part particular, very important because, um, well, um, many part of the Soho sector, as you know, are public sector uh, actors. So for them, it's very important that um, they don't get overburdened also with those administrative requirements. That being said, um, there are exercises ongoing under the 
Parma framework on data collection that followed the whole COVID exercise there. You are familiar with the, the, the SPOC working group, the work of EMA in there. Um, but in, in our sector, you've seen also in the proposal, we, we are giving uh, some specific attention to that and in particular to critical SOHO and also in there there's a role of the of the SOHO data uh, platform that we are developing. So um, particularity of course that you have is that you need to um, comply with both legal frameworks, which is quite unique. I don't think there are many other um, pharma sectors that, that need to do that. So um, we are, um, so I, I, at this moment, the initiatives are both still growing on the two sides, but we are really talking to each other. And I think with uh, EMA, we have regular dialogues. Um, we uh, we talk about the different plasma related files, including how, how the data uh, can be can be better collected and connected, but I I beyond that again I need to give you a bit of the same answer than to the previous question. We know this is coming. We we are aware that in developing the two sides we need to coordinate well, but it it of course it it hasn't um, it, it's still not in place yet. So um the 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 real proof or the real um, way to make it efficient will only be able or come uh, when we go to those next steps. Thank you. And one final question, please hang on with us. Thank you for your patience. Is uh, no so certainly um, one of the, the big aims of, of the pharmaceutical legislation is to, to really make sure um, European Union is at the forefront of medicines manufacturing as well as innovation. And certainly, um, historically, um, this sector has been very, very strong in, in manufacturing of PDMPs in Europe. So. Um, how would you see um, that um, the SOHO legislation and the pharmaceutical legislation actually enhance or contribute to, to the standing of this sector within Europe and making sure that PDMP manufacturing and innovation in, by our sector remains in Europe? We have been seeing historically Europe has been at the forefront of manufacturing. Now we are seeing that this is slightly moving away. Um, this is perhaps more, more, more or, you know, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Thanks, um, Dominica. Um, well, just to first re-emphasize the mandate of the legislation, both pharma and so is really about safety and quality to reassure that there is good safety and quality. That being said, I really think that Europe globally is recognized, is recognized as having good safety quality uh, therapies and being able to deliver those. And that I think really brings a, a, an, an advantage for the manufacturing capacities uh, within the European Union. If we uh, if we make clear that we have up to date and, and good working safety and quality uh, frameworks. Um, another element I think that will play a role um, in, in that is of course is, is the, the more the increased harmonization and I think for pharma the harmonization is much more established than for SOHO but I think with the SOHO proposal the, it's a regulation now and many of the actions in there are really aimed to harmonize more the field I think that will also be a real uh, benefit for for um, for the manufacturers and, and a third element again I want to underline is is this um, and it links back to the, the coordination between the two frameworks we, we mentioned before is also this import um, requirement and, and the fact that um, we have a whole system of the plasma master file setup that makes it quite easy for um, outside plasma to come into the EU for, for manufacturing. So I think that are there are across the, the framework some, some uh, elements, but I think in, in essence the fact that we are able in Europe to have good functioning safety quality um, frameworks is in essence a, a core a value, I think, for, for the manufacturers uh, based in the European Union. Thank you very much. I do not have any further questions. I don't know if, if we have time or are, are you available for questions from the audience? I don't know if this is, or I think we, we are finished. So, Stefan, okay. thank you very much from us here.
I, Thanks I'm trying my best, uh, but I, I realize you're very busy. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you for being available. And we would have loved to have you in person, unfortunately, maybe next time. Thank okay. you very much. Bye -bye. I, am, I would have loved to be in person in uh, it's, Lisbon, it's of great. course. But, I, um, it's yeah. really nice. Good. You are missing I'll a lot about of it fun. Afterwards. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Have a good time. Bye-bye. on to the panel discussion now on strategic autonomy and how we increase plasma donation in Europe. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels. I'm going to be guiding us through this conversation, which is going to touch very much on Brussels and EU policy, which is what I cover day to day. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the experts on a topic that is a pretty hot topic in Brussels right now, I think, as you guys know. Now, you're probably familiar with the SOHO regulation, but you may not be familiar with this whole concept of strategic autonomy. It's a big buzzword in Brussels right now. Uh, the idea is that the EU should be more self-reliant and not overly depend on others, whether they be friend or foe. This is being applied to all kinds of areas, and when it comes to plasma supply, it seems particularly relevant, because Europe currently has a reliance, as we heard before, of about 40% from the US for plasma used to manufacture plasma-derived medicinal products for EU patients. That's a lot of dependence, and that's just the US part of the dependence. Now, this is because the EU's public sector has shown little growth in plasma collection over the past decade. Private plasma donation centers have delivered most of the EU's increased plasma donations that are required to meet the growing clinical need for PDMPs. Over the past 10 years, the use of immunoglobins among the most commonly used PDMPs has almost doubled. For many people's medical conditions, PDMPs are the only possible treatment. Medicines made from human donated plasma are essential for some 300,000 patients across the EU who rely on these therapies every day to treat a variety of rare, chronic, and life-threatening conditions. And yet, Europe has allowed itself to become dependent on others. Now, as we've already heard, in July last year, the European Commission proposed a regulation on standards of quality and safety for substances of human origin intended for human application, called the SOHO regulation. This has been working its way through the legislative process and is currently sitting in the European Parliament. The regulation covers plasma, and some in the European Parliament have proposed amendments that would set stricter conditions around compensation for plasma donation and have suggested that some compensation could entail risks. So on this panel, we're going to talk about how the EU can become more self-reliant when it comes to plasma and how these regulatories could change the situation, particularly in light of what we just heard from Stefan which is that the EU does not consider plasma collection a competence at EU level. And yet, I think as we'll discuss on this panel, some of the changes envisioned in this regulation could impact collection. So let me introduce you to the panelists we have here with us today. We have Johan Privo, who is Executive Director of the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiencies. We have Matthew Hotchko, president of the Marketing Research Bureau, which provides data and forecasts to the plasma collection and uh, fractionation industry. We have Tilman Hausler, who is a researcher in political communication, who has been a plasma donor that has donated 125 times since he started donating in 2014 and has been recounting his experience on social media. We have Behrouz Mansouri, the chief medical doctor at Plasma Vita Healthcare, uh, a plasma donation company based in Leipzig. He is also president of the Scientific Advisory Board at Alliance Rouge in Switzerland. We have Lorenzo Montrasio, senior scientific officer at the Council of Europe's Steering Committee for Human Rights in the fields of biomedicine and health, where he leads work on equity of access to treatments and technologies 
And finally, we have Peter Jaworski, who is an associate teaching professor of strategy, ethics, economics, and public policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University, where he teaches on ethical values of business. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Before we get started, I want to throw a question out to the audience, because it's something Stefan didn't want to answer, and I have a feeling that some of you in the room may, may want to answer this, which is, which country in Europe uh, has the best ecosystem in place to increase plasma collections in Europe? The commission never likes to answer these questions about who's up, who's down, which member state is doing the best job. So we've got it up there on your screen. You can use the, the conference app, which I think you all probably, hopefully have downloaded on your phones by now. Uh, so while you're answering that, I'm going to ask my first question to Johan. Um, so maybe you could just give us, Johan, a, a, an idea of why plasma is so important, particularly for PDMPs, uh, for primary immunodeficiency patients. Why is this such a big deal? Thank you, Dave. Uh, well, I think for, for primary immunodeficiency patients, obviously immunoglobulins uh, is the main treatment for about the, the majority of our PID patients. About 60% of our patients require immunoglobulin replacement therapy um, all their life. Uh, that means monthly infusions. If they go for intravenous, it can mean weekly uh, infusions uh, subcutaneously. And essentially, it replaces a, a missing component in the, in the immune system. So without immunoglobulins, they are prone to repeat infections, severe uh, infections that can lead to organ damage and ultimately can, can lead to death. So these are serious conditions where these therapies are absolutely uh, necessary. Obviously, you don't make uh, immunoglobulins globulins like you make aspirin. Uh, you need plasma, uh, and to have plasma, you need plasma donors. And so for us as a patient community, obviously, um, making sure that we have enough plasma to produce immunoglobulin is extremely important. I should probably say that, that for patients, whether the plasma comes from the voluntary unpaid public sector, whether it comes from the the remunerated or compensated um, you know, uh, plasma sector, ultimately it doesn't matter that much what patients want is safe and effective and well-regulated therapies that ensure they will have quality uh, treatment while ensuring donor protection. And obviously we know that the large majority of plasma uh, comes from plasmapheresis. About 90% of the world plasma comes from plasmapheresis. And Plasmapheresis comes mostly from the private sector where the donors receive a compensation. So, you know, my message is that we are grateful to both uh, compensated plasma donors and voluntary and paid uh, blood donors. And yes, plasma is extremely important to our community. Well, we can see from the results from the audience that two countries have emerged as the clear favorites here, Germany and Austria, for having the best ecosystem for plasma donation. Beirut, you could probably tell us a little bit more about why that might be in a little bit. Um, but before I talk to Beirut about that, Matthew, I wanted to ask you, as I mentioned, you do forecasts for these things. So what are the forecasts right now for plasma donation in Europe? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a good, it's a good question because, uh, as you'll see later in my presentation, there's, there was a, a big change, of course, with, with COVID. And, uh, and, and, and prior to that, uh, there, was, there was a pretty decent growth in the low single digits, but driven mostly by private plasma collections in the past. But since the pandemic, um, there's been efforts on both fronts. There's the EU supply project. Uh, which we're eagerly awaiting to see what the results of that are. And then there's a, a lot of investment on the private side in the four countries that collect. So um, it's difficult to say right now, but it's not going to be uh, in upper single digits. I'd probably say 3%, 5% is probably where, where I would see it going. And, and it could certainly go lower than that uh, if, if uh, the investment's not there. And that, I mean, 3 to 5%, how does that compare to other parts of the globe? Um, it's definitely lower than the United States. The United States is in the upper single digits um, uh, on a long-term basis. In the near term, it's been higher than that. So, you know, half, half the rate hmm. and also half the rate in China. Hmm. Um, Tillman, your, your country is uh, yeah. leaps and bounds above <laughs> everyone else here. So, as I mentioned, you have been donating plasma since 2014. Um, what motivated you to first start doing that? And when you started, did you have any safety concerns about donating? Well, thank you, Dave. 
Um, well, back in the day when I started in 2014, I was a student. So my roommate actually, she pitched it to me and she said, hey, uh, as a student, you always try to make, look for ways to increase your low student income a little bit at least. So, uh, but also you want to spend your time with something meaningful. So, because I mean, there's a lot of job opportunities out there that you can uh, go after. So basic, basically she pitched it to me with, uh, well, you can make uh, 20 bucks an hour. Minimum wage back then was at 850 in Germany. You can read a book during the donation process or your studies. So I was like, well, my time isn't wasted, so to say, with something completely different. Um, then the thing was that you help people who, who need a clotting medicine, uh, like my grandmother. So I was able to relate to that somehow. Um, then the other thing was um, you get to know your blood group. And I always wanted to know my blood group and all of a sudden they gave me an ID because bef before you donate plasma the first time, they take a blood sample from you. So I was like, oh nice, now I get, get this ID. Because uh, you know, if you go to the Red Cross and try just to do the blood donation, it's such a sophisticated, complicated process. And then I got to look when the bus is there and there's no center where, where I studied, where I could go to when I have time. So it was a lot of running after it. And then I think two other factors, um, she pitched, if I memorize it right. One was um, that you get the free health checks every week. Like I did it weekly. So each time I would get a free health check that everything's fine with me. And it was, uh, to, be, to be frank, that was perfect for me because I was trying out uh, special diets because I wanted to lose weight at that time. So then <laughs> I tried out a, a low carb diet and then the doctor said, dude, are you eating a lot of fat because your cholesterol is really high? I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I am. You know, I'm on the local. He's like, well, you know, I think you're overdoing it a little bit, you know, so how about you lower that a little bit? So there was um, kind of like counseling. And the last thing was that uh, it does encourage a healthy lifestyle, so to say, because I always scheduled it on Saturday mornings. So that would keep me away from trouble on a Friday night because uh, you have those uh, alcohol, food and nicotine limitations. And at that time, um, not because of plasma, but just as a personal decision, I uh, started to quit smoking. Um, and you're not supposed to smoke like eight hours before that. So that helped me. It didn't like, you know, make me quit. Um, I did quit though, but it, um, but, but it was a nice, you know, nice push or a nice nudge into, to, towards the right direction. And the last thing was risks you probably asked. Well, I do have to admit, like I used to be afraid of needles and you know, just picturing the image of, you know, I voluntarily let a needle go in here. I always associated this process with something that, oh, I'm hospitalized, so I'm sick. So that was kind of like the, the experience that was wired in my brain with, with the needles. And then also was like, how is this collected? You know, well, what, what device? Do I see it? And she said, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. You know, you, and you can actually push it with a little ball. And then you have this, I saw the machine that I started on. It, it must have been one of those big ones from Fresenius Copy, I think. Now I'm on one with the box. But back then it was that. And at the beginning, I couldn't even look at it. I was like, oh, you know, but after a couple of times, that feeling totally vanished. And then I felt like, OK, well, it's, so that's why I continue doing it because I didn't have a bad experience that made me like that I had to overcome something in order to keep going. Um, Beirut, so you, uh, your company is operating in Germany as well, which we're seeing as viewed as having a good ecosystem for this. Um, in your experience, we've heard a little bit about uh, Tillman's motivations for donating plasma. What have you found is the biggest motivation for people who want to donate? Um, does compensation make a big difference? Is it part? Is it a, a big part of the motivation there? And uh, in terms of the, the the idea of risks for compensation that have been floated, uh, particularly right now in in the Parliament in Brussels, um, what is your opinion on this idea that compensation involves some kind of risk? Yeah, thank you for that uh, important question, and uh, I just uh, I'm still fascinated by by uh, Tillman. Um, um, it is of course uh, very clear, and just follow him. Um, the main main driver for donation, still, um, to my opinion, is um, that people want to help others. It is altruism and. Uh, Including this altruism, 
uh, with a uh, small amount of uh, whatsoever uh, in the different countries of uh, compensation for the time invested. And this is uh, more than one hour, I think. So it is uh, really a adequate and appropriate compensation we offer to the donors. Um, I think this is not the, the main part. I think um, we are grateful and um, our staff and our colleagues um, um, also from the other blood um, and plasma donation facilities uh, are aware about this, uh, that and uh, they are grateful for all the donors and they hopefully all of them um, show that adequately, hopefully, and, um, and this is um, playing together and, and looking after them and looking for their health and always checking if everything is right and okay with them, uh, not only during donations, but prior to and after and in between if there are questions by phone and so on and so forth. This makes a binding and a, a, a connection between donors and, and the uh, blood uh, donation centers. And this is um, a further very important point of, um, of uh, the drivers uh, for so the people coming and donating regularly. So, uh, Lorenzo, you're coming from the Council of Europe, which is, of course, a different organization than the European Union. Uh, the Council of Europe has its own guidelines on compensation. As you watch the European Union's legislation uh, and, and the way that it's treating compensation, um, what are your views and what do you think is the most important piece of that legislation going through? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dave, for, for this question, and thank you very much for having invited me in this, uh, in this uh, panel session. Um, our point of view as Council of Europe, we are an organization that uh, is based on uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, meaning that our, the aim of this organization is completely different from what is the aim of the European Union and the European Union institutions. Uh, we, we, we have a specific convention that is uh, the Oviedo Conventions that uh, actually mention one of the key principles that uh, we consider to be taken in consideration when guiding the member states that are part of this convention in preparing the legislation. And actually this, this principle is the Article 21, that is uh, the prohibition of financial gain from the human body and its part. What is interesting in the new legislation of the, of the European Union is that uh, this legislation is actually about quality and safety, as clearly was explained by, by Stefan Weiderspiegel. At the same time, I guess it's, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, the root of this uh, legislation are um, very well placed uh, in the framework of the ethical charter of the fundamental right of the European Union and at the same time uh, in the European Convention of Human Rights and the Council of Europe Committees on Bioethics. Uh, I guess that, uh, mm, honestly, uh, it's clear that uh, a piece of legislation like uh, the, the, the new draft regulations, uh, it's something that tries to regulate the harmonization of processes, making more efficient uh, all the steps and facilitating the works for company and all the stakeholders that work in the sector. At the same time, when it comes to considering the basic questions that are the basis for any policy work, it's interesting to see where, where the root of this legislation are, and it's interesting to see that uh, there is this mention or of an ethical framework. So the, 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 aim, the aim of this legislation is actually not to regulate in any way ethical aspects. It is clearly a mandate for member states and how to interpret the principle of provision of financial gain and compensation and the different way of how defining the single words. Anyway, we have a single framework and it's really where this legislation starts from. Um, Peter, you've been looking at these issues when it comes to ethics. Um, and as Lorenzo mentioned, the, the aim of the SOHO regulation is not explicitly to do with ethics, and yet we're seeing ethics definitely play a role here, especially in the parliament. Um, so in your view, in terms of different types of compensation, because there's many different types of compensation that are um, possible, what's 
acceptable in terms of ethics? And are all, would you say all types of compensation are ethically equal? Um, it's a difficult question. I think for the most part, almost any type of compensation from my perspective is ethical. It shouldn't be too little. And there's something that might be said about offering far too much. But what matters is access for patients and ensuring that the way that we collect the plasma is safe for donors. Those are the two things that matter most in this debate. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that not just in the European Union, but also this debate in Canada, uh, in Australia, in New Zealand, and other countries as well, uh, we over-prioritize donors and their altruism. We over-prioritize the issue of community solidarity, and we under-prioritize the issue of patient access to these therapies. But the moral point of collecting plasma, of having a system of plasma collection, is to make sure that patients get the therapies that they need. The point is not to give you or me or anyone in this audience or Tillman uh, an opportunity to express our altruism. There are so many different ways that we can express our altruism, but for many patients, there are there's just immunoglobulin. There's only one sort of therapy that they can uh, that they need in order to continue to live uh, a good life. Similarly, the point is not to promote community solidarity. I know in France, in Italy, in Spain, they call it a solidarity donation. Blood donations are called solidarity donations. But that's not the point. We're not collecting plasma in order to like stitch us together, to give us another reason to be proud, to be uh, German-Canadian in my case, or something like that. That's not the point. So we are, in a way, losing sight of the main point. And this issue about compensation, how much do we pay? Like, what are the motives of the donors? These are interesting questions, but they're surely secondary to the primary moral point, which is making sure that patients have access to therapies. Let's focus in on the patient's need and whether that's being delivered in Europe. Johan, um, so we see from the results of the survey, Germany uh, is viewed as having a good ecosystem here. What is, what's the situation in Germany in terms of self-sufficiency self versus other places? Um, and how does that affect patients mm -hmm. and what they're, what they're receiving? And then also, um, from a patient perspective, I think we heard a bit of skepticism from Stefan before about whether the SOHO regulation can is meant to deliver a better outcome for patients. Mm -hmm. I, I was a bit unclear what he was saying there, but do you think the SOHO regulation is a good vehicle for getting more plasma to more people? Mm. Well, thank you for, for, for these two questions. First of all, I, I would react to one of the words you've used, which is self-sufficiency or, or sufficiency. I think when we, we, we talk about this concept, um, we often, at least in the field of, of plasma and plasma products, uh, get confused between blood, blood and plasma. And I think a lot of the issues that we see uh, in some of the discussions at European level and beyond, I'm sure, um, is the confusion that uh, people make between, between blood and plasma. I mean, obviously, when you talk about blood national self-sufficiency, you're talking about labile blood products that are meant for transfusion, that are going to be used quite rapidly. Um, and you need to have your national um, you know, reserve of, of, of this product. When you talk about plasma, you're really talking about the raw material for pharmaceutical products that are, that are going to travel across um, you know, different countries and different, and different world regions. Then when you look at it from a patient perspective, especially if you're a PID patient, Self-sufficiency really would mean that you have access to a range of immunoglobulin therapies so that each patient has access to the perfect treatment, if you will, uh, for themselves. We know that patients are going to react very differently and tolerate differently uh, different immunoglobulin therapies, and there's lots of evidence about that, and, and we talk about that um, a lot. So I think if we look at Germany, but if we look also at Austria, uh, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, which are obviously the four member states that collect probably more plasma than they need, and then that plasma can help the other countries. Obviously, it's extremely important uh, that we have more countries in Europe uh, being able to collect more. But we need to also uh, look at the world in two different ways. I think we need to look at the world when there's no shortages, 
And we need to look at the world when we are facing a shortage. And obviously, we've just faced shortages because of, of COVID-19, and we've all seen what that has meant. And I say that because in a world where there are no shortages, what you want for plasma products is the ability to travel across continents so that they reach the patient that most needs that specific product. They are pharmaceutical products. They have nothing to do with products for transfusion. So that's very important. Then a world affected by shortage is going to be much better equipped if the balance of plasma collection is better spread across the regions. If we all depend on a region, it's, it's, it's not good for anyone. We often say in Europe, well, what happens if there is um, a political or economic reason um, the new US government somehow closes the gates, we keep the products for ourselves, or um, there is a new viral threat that, that, that threatens the supply of plasma in the US, that would be terrible for us European patients because we rely 40% on, on US product. But it'd be terrible for American patients as well, and probably first. So what I'm trying to say is that in a world affected by shortage, we are much better off when each region actually collects more and we have a more balanced uh, world supply of plasma. And this is why, as patients, we have been talking about global sufficiency. Global sufficiency of plasma products based on regionally balance plasma collection. Now, it sounds a little bit complicated, but if you follow what I've said, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Um, so this is something that is, um, you know, very important to us. The other thing I want to say, uh, because I fully agree uh, with what Peter um, has said, that sometimes uh, the discussions around these ethical uh, issues are really blurring uh, blurring the debate and we lose sight of what's really important and that's access um, for the patients. I'll give you an example. Again, if we go back to COVID-19, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, um, we saw several initiatives when the role of plasma was uh, potentially going to be helpful to treat a lot of people affected by COVID-19. So if you go back to 2020, there were lots of discussions about hyperimmune globulins, about um, about plasma uh, uh, from donors that have been affected by, by COVID-19, convalescent plasma, that could play a crucial role. What we saw internationally is private, public sector collaborations. And what was very striking for our patients' community is that suddenly everything we had asked about for many years was becoming concrete. The world was focusing on getting safe and effective treatment to people to save lives. And if you go back to these debates, there were very, very little discussions about, by the way, where does the plasma come from? Does it come from a voluntary unpaid blood donor or does it come from a compensated plasma donor? No, the objective there was getting safe and effective treatment for the patient. If we can do it for the world's population, why can we not do it for the rare diseases population? Yes. So that's a, a, a very important point. So, you know, to come back to your second question, I think, yes, of course, the SOHO regulation uh, can play a role. Um, I agree also with, with what was said. Um, it is perhaps true that the, the regulation in itself does not um, intend to tell member states how they have to organize their plasma collection. But if you start talking about uh, voluntary unpaid donation, and if you start defining compensation, in a way you're doing it. And so I think the so um, legislation needs to be a neutral ground on these matters so that member states can enforce the decisions that they feel are the right ones okay. for their um, you know, specific national uh, environments. And, and hopefully that can encourage some additional European member states uh, to look at, at the model that we have in these four countries in the EU. We also don't need to do exactly what America does. Um, you know, European member states might want to do it a bit differently. If you look at the frequency of donations in these four member states, they vary. Um, I think one of them, I can't remember if it's the Czech Republic, also asks for plasma donors to donate blood as well. So there are, you know, different ways that you can implement these measures, but I feel we would be best served if the SOAR regulation provided a neutral ground on, on these uh, matters. 
And that idea of a supply interruption that you mentioned isn't so inconceivable considering that during COVID, the United States banned the export of COVID vaccines to Europe, uh, something that surprised a lot of Europeans, uh, surprised less Americans, I think. Um, Matthew, uh, so uh, Johan just mentioned that in the Czech Republic, they require uh, you to give blood along with plasma. There has been concern uh, expressed that uh, the plasma donation could like crowd out blood donation and you could actually end up with less people giving blood because they're giving plasma instead. According to your research and your forecast, is that a realistic worry? Yeah, th thanks for the question. Uh, one clarification, um, the next panel will have a panelist from Hungary who will talk about donating blood and plasma. It's not Czech Republic, it's Hungary. But um, uh, with that aside, um, Crowding out, it's definitely a hot topic, um, but in, in, in the data that, that we've analyzed, uh, I think Germany is a, a great example of, of this, where there is, is high amounts of whole blood donation and high amounts of plasma, source plasma apheresis. And, and you don't see the, 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 the crowding out, and, and as this has been explained to me in, in, by numerous people in these countries, is because there's largely different populations of people who want to donate source plasma from recovered um, whole blood. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, uh, including where you donate it, the frequency that you donate it, whether or not it's compensated in a market like Hungary or Germany. And so you don't see, you, you really are tapping in to a whole different population that's currently not giving blood if you have private plasma collections, because they just aren't giving blood at the beginning and they may be interested in giving plasma. So it's a whole new potential source of donors to, to that broader industry. Well, Tillman, let me ask you, what made you decide to become a, a frequent plasma donor rather than a, a frequent blood donor? Hmm. Oof. <laughs> Actually, I never really, th huh. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, it didn't, it didn't occur to you. That the... uh, it didn't occur to me. Well, I always had, like, even before donating plasma, I always had, like, a really rather low iron levels. So if I would donate uh, blood, uh, you know, I would like, like, like the, the, the person where I first donated, blood was actually at some Red Cross bus, as I, as I said previously. Um, and then they said, well, you know, we, we're not that, it's a little low, your, your iron, but it just makes it. But then you'll need like four to five other weeks, uh, uh, at least just for the iron to recover. Uh, uh, or something like, so it was probably the time period. And also... Um, well, you can only donate blood. I think like I, can, I can, could only do it like six times a year. So from, for, from a perspective of effective altruism, for example, I mean, this does not oppose what Peter said. I think it kind of builds upon it because if you can uh, find ways in order to uh, boost the numbers of people who donate plasma or blood, the patient's needs are served anyway. So, um, yeah. Let's focus in on some of the safety concerns that have been raised. Um, Beiruz, the, what, what's the difference in terms of safety between plasma donation and blood donation? Let me just say that uh, at, at the end, both um, processes um, are not different in, in safety for the donors. Why is that? Um, of course, there is a different um, procedure um, if you look at the whole blood donation which uh, usually um, um, takes about 10 to 15 minutes and it is uh, it is finished and, and the whole blood is taken and um, about uh, 450 to 500 mls and um, with that you lose red cells um, and you have heard about it takes a little bit longer to restore uh, them and therefore uh, females uh, take a little bit longer um, um, in addition to restore that uh, you have a four times for the females and six times for the males at least in Germany and Austria and um, 
If you do a uh, aphoresis donation, you, you just have a extracorporeal circulation and you have a um, necessity of um, anticoagulation of the blood. So it is a little bit more complicated, of course. So it may just, if you have a first look at this, um, um, be self-evident it is more dangerous but this is not true because of course we always as physicians and skilled staffs are trained to, to build layers of safety measure, measures and um, precautionary me measures to, to take care for this additional uh, procedures complicated procedures as a uh, first sight um, complicated procedures and if you have a well-trained staff and and are experienced with these methods and have safety uh, layers on top of the normal blood donation procedure it is an equal uh, procedure according safety for the donor otherwise it would be not ethical and I can promise you I'm um, in November, it will become 40 years being in blood donation and transfusion. Um, I personally even um, can say I have not seen any difference in danger for donors. Um, Lorenzo, one thing that the plasma sector has not liked about the uh, draft legislation is that uh, it implies that plasma donation has some level of inherent risk. Now, Stefan was asked about that uh, earlier. He has a kind of different understanding, I think, of the language there. But let me ask you, in terms of the Council of Europe's guidelines, uh, does the Council of Europe's guidelines have anything about implied risk of plasma donation? Uh, well, no, actually not. Uh, it's, about, it's not about uh, the risk of plasma donations. There are no differences uh, in, uh, with this respect. Um, again, uh, um, we are concerned by the more the, 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 the human right protections, okay, and we are not uh, much about uh, the, 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 the quality and safety. And it's it, it's really we don't have uh, specific tools regarding the risks. Whilst, uh, for example, we have uh, other interesting tools that has been considered in the new legislation that uh, support practicalities in managing uh, the, the donors. This is, for example, refers to the fixed rate compensation. Uh, that is, what is this, this, this? It's interesting that uh, this uh, wording, this idea of having a fixed rate compensation it's something that comes from the guideline that implemented the principle of the non-prohibition prohibition of um, financial gain. Uh, and this is seen uh, really as a need of the member states of having something practical to deal with the compensation of donors. Um, having always in mind that the idea is to have a, a financial neutrality. Uh, the approach of the Council is that uh, the motivation of, of the donor shouldn't be the need for a financial support. As mentioned before, probably the, it, it's quite clear that there is a, a high component of uh, altruistic approach. There is a high component of solidarity. Um, but then it's clear that there are practical tools that can support how to manage the donor and the compensation. And the fixed rate compensation is one of these tools. Um, so we've talked about some of the worries that are floating around out there about uh, plasma collection. Let's put up the next question for the audience. We have another question for you guys to answer using the app. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what, according to you, is the biggest misperception about plasma donation? Uh, I'm not sure if you have that on your app. I don't have it on the screen. Oh, wait, yes, there. Uh, so, yes, what is, according to you, the biggest misperception about plasma donation? You have a couple different options there about risk, about it crowding out blood donations. So what do you think the public thinks the most? I'll give you guys a little time to answer that. In the meantime, let me move on to focus on the ethics around plasma donation. Uh, now, again, Peter, you're the, the expert on this. Um, can you explain what is the difference between compensation and incentives when it comes to ethics and what is fair uh, for a plasma donor considering they are giving up 
not only their plasma but also their their time uh, and uh, and you know taking away them away from work them away from other activities this type of thing yeah okay so uh, the fairness question is going to be complicated the difference between compensation and incentives compensation is intended to make you whole so it's intended so that you when you donate plasma all you lose is the plasma you don't also lose your time your effort uh, you know the cost of getting to the plasma center and so on that's the idea behind compensation an incentive is over and above that it's something that you know it draws you towards engaging in this practice um, in terms of fairness i mean i'm not i think every country that compensates plasma donors in all of these cases the compensation is fair the amount of compensation that we can expect if you know different countries adopt a model that allows for compensation i think we can expect that amount to be uh, fair, right? Um, Tillman mentioned that the amount of money that he received in Germany was 20 euro at the time. Is that right? And the minimum wage was eight euro. 850, yeah. 850. That's look. That's that's really good for an hour, hour and a half of your time. That's that's a good and fair deal. In the United States, I think the average at the moment is about 75 dollars, something like that. That's a very fair deal, right? And in my case, when I donated, it was a hundred dollars to donate. That, that was, and, and I didn't turn that money away. Of course I took it, right? I was happy to take that money. Um, yeah, so I think across, the, across the, the gamut of all of these different countries, I, I don't think there's much of a question about fairness. Now, if I can comment a little bit on some of the things that have been asked before, if that's okay. Johan mentioned that suddenly the world sort of paid a lot of attention to convalescent plasma when we were confronted by a pandemic that affected all of us. It's interesting to point out that many countries that ban or prohibit compensation switched and they allowed compensation for convalescent plasma. Surely if I were a rare disease patient, I would look askance at that. I would be very puzzled why these countries are adopting this model. Clearly they think it works. Clearly they must not have sufficient moral objections if they are allowing it in the case of convalescent plasma. But as soon as we're back to the rare disease community, then all these questions, oh, well, is it commodification? Are we exploiting people? Uh, do people have the right motives when they get into it? Right, look, we, we pay nurses, we pay doctors, right? If we didn't pay nurses and if we didn't pay doctors, we would have shortages of nurses and we would have shortages of doctors. So of course we pay nurses and doctors. Why are we so focused on plasma donors and their motives and you know those kinds of questions? Uh, let's see here, um, crowding out. So I've actually conducted uh, one study and I'm in the midst of another one. I looked at the case of Canada and the United States. Uh, that paper is available on SSRN. It is currently under review. It should be published sometime very soon. What we found, and I know, I think Sylvain from Canadian Blood Services is here, so he can confirm or deny what I'm about to say. I'm looking around, I don't know where he is, but um, we found no crowding out in Canada nor in the United States. If you look at the results in the Czech Republic, you didn't see crowding out in the Czech Republic either. Uh, I'm working with a team from the um, Vienna University of Business and Economics. We're going to do a study in Austria, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we will see what those results are, but we haven't seen that anywhere. So we've got the results here, so we can see that very clearly the audience feels that the biggest misperception out there is that compensating plasma donors puts donors at risk of their own health. Um, and some others that are runners up there you can see is that that yeah. compensation leads to lower quality plasma and the compensation puts patients at risk. Um, Lorenzo, in terms of the, the Council of Europe's guidelines on this, um, there, there's, as, I think you must, as you mentioned before, there's some specific things about fixed rate allowances. Um, so the, the guidelines prohibit financial gain with respect to donations, um, but clarifies that the reimbursement of expenses incurred and compensation for loss is acceptable. Uh, and fixed rate allowances seem to fall into that. Can you explain what the difference is there and, and how the Council of Europe draws that distinction? 
Um, sorry, the distinction between uh, compensation and uh, please and and and, uh, and uh, financial gain. Financial gain. So okay. So um, financial gain is something okay, that I, I guess that uh, uh, we can reason about. What does it mean a financial gain as an outcome of a donation? Uh, what uh, we don't want in this sense is that this became the main driver for donating. Um, we also think that uh, it's not, uh, even if uh, we, in a, we, we I, I guess that one misconcept uh, in uh, this discussion, in addition to what we are seeing, is that uh, just allowing for more freedom in compensating, remunerating, could bring more plasma. I guess this is not uh, true. Uh, we have seen that the shortages of products, uh, there are not only for uh, plasma the right products, but during COVID-19 there were a lot of shortages, even with a different and more simple manufacturing process. Uh, so um, the idea that I uh, want to bring uh, the Council of Europe uh, behind the prohibition of financial gain and the financial neutrality is that there, there, there should be a system that cooperate in order with the, uh, reaching the same goal. And the same goal is clearly the protection of patients. But having also in mind that uh, in healthcare, every resource is a scarce and every resource can be subject to shortages. And that's why it's very important that the member states of the Council and in general governments set for priorities. Whether it's the level of availability of products, it's important to have a priority on how to use the products. And on top of this, where the Council is, is that when you set your priority, it's very important that within your country, within your society, you are very careful that there are no discrimination in accessing process, products. Sorry, When it comes to, for example, differences in socioeconomic conditions, health literacy, and how really patients can have access to products. That is really key. It's not, I guess that uh, there is even too much discussion and focus on financial neutrality, non-compensation, remuneration. This is part of, of, uh, of the discussion. It's very important to work together. It's very important that all the parties try to do the best and try to collaborate for providing products for patients. Beirut, what would you say is the difference between compensation and incentives uh, and which do donors tend to, do all donors want the same type of compensation or does it vary? The second question is, uh, I think, a really uh, complicated one. Um, of course, maybe uh, that individually um, the, the interests for compensations are different. Um, I just stated um, that I, I think the compensation should be appropriate. And now um, we become um, difficult. Um, um, I am a physician and I'm not a, a ethic specialist or, or um, a financial, uh, financial specialist, specialist. And, um, and um, for that reason, I am, I am, let me say, I'm very conservative and say it has to be appropriate. Um, so what, what is the difference, to give an example? Um, for me, it, um, it seems, for instance, not really appropriate to, for one donation to, uh, for instance, give a, a free day from uh, work, so holiday. Um, this, to my opinion, seems a little bit more than appropriate. Um, but still, um, if um, our, our goal is to, to get our um, plasma donations um, necessary to, to, to have the medicines that, um, necessary for our patients, um, you have to discuss it with the ethic specialist. Is this okay or not? And this I don't dare to, to decide by my own. Just again, I think it should be appropriate. And if it is more, it's okay. If it is less, it's also okay. The goal is to have the product at the end of the day. 
Um, Tillman, I'm curious. You, um, I, I mentioned that you you posted a lot about your experiences as a donor on social media. Have you ever gotten questions about the ethics from friends or even from strangers on social media of people curious about ethical dimensions? Uh, well, every, every once in a while, but usually, usually the questions uh, I ask is like other causes to to donate to. But first, I should probably first answer your question. Um, well, they asked me like, okay, how does this work? Like, like, do they make money with with the with your donation? I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> they make medicine out of it, so they have to sell it. So, to some extent, they provide me with a compensation plus the structure uh, and an environment that I feel comfortable donating in. So, those were rather short discussions or it was rather were rather questions. But I had like uh, not a vast majority of people that that asked me, okay, like. Uh, uh, like nobody was thinking that you can make money with it, like like uh, to to become financially dependent on it. Like some people, from what I've experienced, is that they say they set themselves some sort of a goal. When I speak to other donors, for example, and then they say, I don't know, by within three years, I'm saving for something, and this can contribute to this, but not only. So they're not donating so that they have the pressure, uh, uh, and it feels like work, and then it goes totally the, the, the wrong way. So basically, yes, but what, what I'm doing, and the, that's where I get the most response, because uh, I'm, I'm telling you this because you mentioned my social media uh, postings, and uh, I needed it uh, yesterday as well. So at some point when I started working, the financial incentive was totally gone. Like, I mean, okay, for, for now it's 25 euros, but 25 euros is not like, I mean, $100, I would say that's maybe an ethical question. And I would say, okay, $100, if you get $100 for each donation, that would be like $400 a month up to 500. For some people, that's an income. And, uh, Until America, <laughs> yeah. but um, uh, maybe, maybe just you got, <laughs> got $100. Um, but so for the 25 uh, euros that I that I'm still getting, I was thinking like, okay, what can I do with it? I don't I don't need it, uh, and it's but it's still a routine that I go after. So I mean, humans usually they, they like to stay in their routines, and then I keep having this uh, Saturday meeting. So what I do now is I check in, I take a selfie, and then uh, I post it on uh, social media, and then I add a sticker to it that asks like name a cause that I can donate to. Uh, and then, you know, I donate, I read a book, I enjoy my Saturday. And then uh, at the evening, I'll look up like, did any suggestions come? And in order to make sure some comes, you know, I threaten uh, my followers that if they don't make a suggestion, I invest the money into cryptocurrencies, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just to let the whole system collapse. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so um, this just happened once. <laughs> <laughs> now this has become a running gag, so some people even suggest me to, to uh, buy cryptocurrencies, but I always have like an ongoing list. So I, uh, at the end of the day, I usually pick one, and then I make a post that I say, hey, I donated to this cause, I screenshot the proof that I really transferred it, either from PayPal or from uh, the bank transfer, I tag the person who recommended it, I tag the institution the donation goes to, I tag the donation center where I made the donation, and I provide the post with a link you can easily click on in case you want to get more information about the cause and donate for yourself. And uh, so far, yeah, it's... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I've been doing this for a couple of years now, and then uh, uh, I think like half a year or something, Br Britta uh, and a colleague of her, they discovered it on social media because uh, uh, sometimes they, they check it too. So um, people even started donating because of it. Uh, and they told me, yeah, I saw your postings every day. And at some point, you know, I finally, you know, uh, uh, I, I finally uh, convinced myself to just go once, you know. And then usually if they do it once, they, they're more likely to do it twice or three times. And some of them have become regular donors. So it can work to a little bit, you know, do the, this whole fuzzy thing around it if it encourages people to, uh, to start the donation process itself. But of course, I agree with you that the focus should be on the, uh, on the patient's needs. That's really great. Okay, so one more question for you guys, and then I'll open it up to some questions from the audience to the panelists. Uh, last question is, is compensating donors by using a fixed rate allowance with conditions set by member states compatible with the concept of the voluntary unpaid donation? 
And I'm just going to go ahead and call it. It's a yes from the audience. So the audience feels that that is compatible with the concept of the voluntary unpaid donation. Uh, I know certainly there's some MEPs in the parliament who would disagree with that. Uh, but that is, as I mentioned, a, a lively debate happening right now in Brussels. Um, okay, let's take some questions from the audience for the panel. Does anybody have a question they would like to ask? It's a bit dark here, so if you could raise your hand vigorously. Nope, going once. Going twice? All right, I'm going to ask another question to Johan then. Um, so I, as I was just referring to the, the debate and the political debate, as we've watched the SOHO regulation go through the legislative process in Brussels, there's been a lot of focus on this ethical issue around compensation. Do you think that the, the patient need aspect of this debate might be getting a bit lost in that debate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that most of the ethical uh, discussions that are ongoing at the moment are really around compensating or not compensating, voluntary and paid or, or compensated. Um, and by extension, I feel that there's a wider debate about the public and the private sector mm. and one sector in it for the money and commercializing and the other sector not, not in it for the money and commercializing. And so I think it goes back to what I, I started by saying, that we, we need to, to have more clarity on these things because we work in, in quite a complex field. Um, it is wrong to think that, that plasma coming from a voluntary unpaid blood donor is not going to play a part in the economic chain of the production of, of plasma products. We know that they are um, you know, public sector organizations who collect from voluntary unpaid donors who then sell the plasma uh, to get fractionated. So I think, I think it's become like bigger than just compensation and, and voluntary and paid. And often it's public versus private sector. And then we, the patients, we kind of stuck in the middle. And um, I think we have talked a lot about ethics, but we haven't talked about mathematics yet. <laughs> and um, if we talk about mathematics, because sometimes it, 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 it's very important to mention it, 90% of the world plasma comes from apheresis plasma, comes from plasma apheresis. There's a very simple reason for that. You can collect more often, more plasma, right? Between uh, 600 and eight, 850 probably millimeters of plasma per, per plasma donation. You're going to extract about 200 to 250 millimeters from a, a blood donation. Blood donation frequency is usually between four and six times per year. Plasma donation, well, twice a week in the US, uh, 33 times uh, is the limit by the, by the Council of Europe, Germany, I can't remember if it's 50 or 60. 60, yeah. 60, 60. Um, but, but, but so the, you can donate up to twice a week much more plasma. And so that just means that the growing needs of our patient communities has been mostly met by those who collect source plasma. It doesn't mean that the patients are pro-industry or against the public sector or, or whatever. The patients are, are in the middle of this and all the patients want is access to safe and effective therapies. It just so happens, and Europe is a good example if we look at the last 20 years, that the private sector has been able to invest more in plasma collection facilities and therefore has been collecting on a per capita basis, if you look at these four member states, probably three times more than the other member states where you don't have the private sector. Um, no one is against more public funding for public sector plasma pheresis. No one has ever said that, but we, we also need to be very logical and look at how it's been going the last 20 and 30 years. And we've seen one way of collecting plasma paying off much more than the other way. So we still say that blood donors are important, but obviously they contribute less uh, than plasma donors. So having more investments into plasma pheresis, whether it comes from the, the, the private or the public sector, is very important. And so we're trying to, you know, to bring back the discussion around, um, around these access issues mm -hmm. and around practical um, aspects. I mean, we cannot deny uh, that it's much more difficult to collect more plasma if we were only 
basing ourselves on voluntary unpaid blood donation system. It just wouldn't work. So you need to have a different approach in, in Europe. And I go back to what I've said about having a, a, you know, a SOHO that enables member states to make uh, their own decision and doesn't push them in one way or another. And, and I think part of the issue is what we've heard about compensating for a loss. I personally don't like that notion of, of loss um, because to me, and I may be wrong, I don't know, you, you tell me, but if, if, you make, if, if, you, if it's compensate a loss, you kind of imply you've lost some form of an income, some form of an income. So does that mean that if you are a student making a little bit of, of extra money or you are unemployed, you shouldn't be entitled to be compensated for loss because you don't have wages, right? And that, to me, it, it, it seems a little bit strange, um, especially if we put it in, 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 uh, in parallel to what a lot of blood donors coming from the voluntary unpaid uh, sector receive, for example, one day of work. Um, what does that represent? Isn't that... Um, also a form of, of income. So, so I think it's very important that, um, you know, we try to have a, a definition of, of compensation that's flexible enough, I would say, to mean that uh, you can also donate plasma if you are a student. You can also donate plasma if you don't have an income, because we need people like like you, I mean, no, you have an income, but we also, also needed you when you didn't have one and you were, and you were a student. So I, I don't like that concept of loss too much. Well, on the mathematics, actually the next panel after the break is going to be on member state initiatives in increasing plasma donation. Matthew, you're going to be uh, moderating that. So I'll give you the last word on this panel so you can kind of tee us up for the next one. Sure. Um, but on that topic, I mean, it, there... There is a direct correlation between uh, plasma donations and the availability of, of the plasma that's needed to make medicines, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, the, uh, you know, when Johan was talking about 90% of, of plasma used for fractionation by this in industry globally is coming from aspheresis. That's exactly the numbers, and you'll see the charts in the next presentation. Um, but if you look at uh, how much uh, how much of that's collected by the the private versus the public institutions? Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, and it's not in my presentation. I apologize, but it's probably also ninety ten. So uh, you know, ninety percent of ninety percent, which would be around eighty percent of total plasma used for fractionation, is collected by apheresis by private companies for those private companies to fractionate and deliver to products. So it's, it's, it's the vast majority. Um, and so there's, there's a definitely a direct correlation between that and, uh, and uh, the availability that all the patients in the room and around the world need. Well, we'll wrap it up there. I want to thank the panelists for some really interesting interventions. I think we've heard um, consensus around the idea that there are different forms of compensation, but compensation does not imply any risk directly, um, but that you could have a level of compensation that could be unethical. I think we've heard uh, very, very high or very, very low would be two examples of something that might, that might not work. Uh, so definitely some nuance in the, in the argument there. Uh, so a round of applause for our panelists. And yeah, we'll see where this legislation goes in Brussels. It's one of the files I am watching very keenly because uh, it is one of the, the more interesting things happening there right now. Um, we're going to take a break now uh, for 45 minutes. So you can be back here in the room at 11.30 for session five on EU member states initiatives in increasing plasma collection. And in the meantime, you can do some more networking outside. Thanks a lot. <laughs>